Ladies and gentlemen, live from London. From the heart of London's Theatreland and Clubland, we bring you the best of the new breed of London's comics. London Funnies. Please welcome our first act of this evening, David Badil. Thank you. Great. Um, I think I'll just tell you a bit more about myself. I, I am an anxious sort of male. There's good reason for this. I've been beaten up twice in my life. Once for being Jewish, once for being a Pakistani. <laughs> um, I think most of my anxiety, though, can be traced back to my father. My father had a lot of psychological problems. He had what is now known as a narcissistic schizophrenic guilt complex. He would stand for hours staring at his own reflection in the mirror and going, that's the man, officer. <laughs> Um, my parents never thought I was going to be a social satirist. They always thought I was going to be a scientist. But it always amuses me how wrong parental prediction always is. Like when Aaron Neville was three, for example. His father turned to his mother and said, You know, I think Aaron's going to grow up to be a slim, handsome man without a great wobbly wart on his forehead. <laughs> Similarly, when Dan Quayle was three, his father turned to his mother and said, You know, I think Dan's going to grow up... <laughs> Amazing how wrong you can be. Most important man in my early life was my grandfather. And I remember when he died, my mother used to go to his grave and put flowers on it. She said it's what he would have wanted. I see what she meant by that. It's like what he would have wanted if he was still alive. <laughs> it's quite a bit odd, because what he would have wanted if he was still alive was to be dug up. <laughs> I was actually named after that grandfather. My middle name is Lionel. I'm sure you think that's embarrassing. But I should tell you that like, in America, that's a really hip name. It's a sort of name that scratch urban hip-hop rapper DJs have. I mean, I have it on good authority that LL Cool J's real name is Lionel Lionel Cool J. <laughs> LL Cool J, of course, goes back to tradition that began with the blues, and I always wanted to be a blues singer. But then I realised I haven't got a disability, because that's what you need to be a blues singer, like a blind lemon pie. He was a real blues singer. And, of course, he was blind. That wasn't bad enough. He was also, of course, a lemon pie. That's <laughs> <laughs> made things very difficult. Uh, I've got some workmen in at the moment. And I really hate it when I have workmen in, you know, because they, they just can't mend what they've come to mend. You know, it's always got to be, well, I could do it, but obviously I'd have to rewire the place, you know, take the carpet off, uh, demolish that block of flats over there, uh, reverse all the human rights legislation passed in the last 45 years, and trace the surviving members of Leonard Skinner. But I only ask if you could pull your trousers up over your ass. <laughs> And similarly, like, they, they, they have to tell you that everything else in your house is also broken or rubbish. It's like, oh, that joist is all wrong. And who put that fuse box there? What else? Oh, yeah, your stereo's crap, and uh, your wife's a bit of a dog, and uh, you know that picture of your mother on the mantelpiece? She looks a right whore. <laughs> Basically, your whole life is rubbish. That'll be 200 quid. <laughs> I think I did mention earlier that I am Jewish. Uh, a friend of mine is half Jewish. He's got a two-skin. <laughs> Round his neck, he wears a little triangle. Never mind. Um, I've got a classic Jewish mother, right? My mother is the sort of woman who, if I fell into a river, would shout, Help! Come quick! Come quick! My son, the university graduate, is drowning! <laughs> I'm not really a practicing Jew, although there is one of the Old Testament commandments that I do live my life by very stringently, and that is I never, ever covet my neighbour's oxen. <laughs> He's got a bloody nice one as well. <laughs> A lot of people tell you the main problem with being Jewish is like anti-Semitism or neo-Nazism or Barbara Streisand. But I can tell you that the main problem with being Jewish is that whenever you go to a bar mitzvah, at the party afterwards, some bloke will always stand up and tell a joke, right? And the punchline will always be in Yiddish, which is a mystery to me, all right? So there you are, and Mr. Goldblatt will suddenly stand up and tell the one about, about Jaime, whose foreskin has recently grown back, right? And Jaime goes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, my foreskin has grown back, what shall I do? And the rabbi turns to him and he says, Jaime, Moses said, when the light of the world is shining, we must turn our faces to the sky. And Joshua, he said, when the light of the world is dim, we must turn our faces to the ground. But I say, 
Wenn der Putsch steht in der Jentel, dann hast du Soros für der Kanadlach in der Schlonger. <laughs> and the whole place will piss itself laughing. The rabbi will go all red and start choking on his pickled herring, and Mrs. Rosenberg will die, and everyone will start going, oi, and oi, and hitting themselves on the forehead. And you think, what? But I tell a lie, because like, Yiddish is a brilliant language. So every word in Yiddish is onomatopoeia. Like, have you ever heard of a better word for the male organ than schmuck? <laughs> schmuck capturing exactly that sort of slapping sound the penis makes when dropped against the inner thigh. <laughs> sort of schmuck. <laughs> schmuck. Or if you're lucky, schmuck! <laughs> Which brings me on to the subject of sex. I, I met this woman the other day, actually. And we went back to her place and we were standing in the living room. And I said to her suavely, is that coffee I smell? And she said, it is and you do. No, I, actually, I, that's a complete lie anyway. I, I myself have been in a long-term relationship for a long time. And one of the things that happens in a long-term relationship is that time goes on, you gradually lose your physical inhibitions in the presence of your partner. And I think it's good this doesn't happen earlier on, right? I think it's good that when I was 15, I wasn't ringing girls up and going, Hi, it's David. I met you the other day. I just wondered if you wanted to come round to my place and clean your teeth while I have a crap. <laughs> All right, you're already going round to Steve's to fart under the duvet. Fair enough. <laughs> But one good thing about being in a long-term relationship it means you don't have to worry about Valentine cards and who they're from. Because for years, I didn't know that people would disguise their identity on their Valentine cards by, like, writing with the wrong hand. And for years, I didn't know this, and I thought all my admirers had cerebral palsy. <laughs> <laughs> or had just written the card after four hours of solid masturbation. I'm going to leave it there. You've been great. I've been David Badil. Good night. And now, please welcome Joe Brand. Hello. Oh, you can't see me, can you? Hang on. <laughs> Here I am. Yes, it's true, I was the child who always got picked to play Bethlehem in the school nativity play. <laughs> and even then, Mary and Joseph used to keep mistaking me for Scotland, so uh, that was a bit of a shame. Now, actually, you have noticed, haven't you, already, that I didn't grow up to be exactly what you'd call anorexic, but... Um, that is, in fact, wrong. I am anorexic because uh, anorexic people look in the mirror and think they look fat. <laughs> <laughs> and so do I, so I must be. <laughs> and actually, my weight problem got a lot worse when I went on the pill, so that proved to be a very effective contraceptive. <laughs> But actually, you know, it's the new year now, isn't it? And uh, I've made a New Year's resolution. I'm going to get more exercise. I'm going to sit up in bed and have a cigarette instead of lying down. So um, <laughs> I think that'll sort me out. Now, my big problem at the moment, actually, is I'm desperate for a husband. I have to tell you, I am. I'm 33 and I'm desperate. And my flatmate said to me, don't worry, all you actually have to do is read Cosmopolitan magazine because all their articles are about how to get a husband despite the fact that they're rather thinly disguised as articles on more general topics for the ever-so-slightly feminist woman. For example, I read an article in Cosmo recently about how to speak knowledgeably at parties on quantum mechanics theory, whilst giving someone a blowjob, <laughs> and asking them to marry you all at the same time. Now, I tried it, but the man on the cheese counter at the delicatessen... <laughs> said he didn't think it was very hygienic, uh, quite so near to the cheddar, but that's another story, I think. Now, the thing I like about Cosmo, actually, is the quizzes. They're great, aren't they? They're brilliant. I did this quiz in Cosmo recently as well, and it was called, Are You a Fat Old Bastard? <laughs> and surprisingly enough, I got top marks, and um, I was advised to go on a diet before Weight Watchers got a contract out on me. Now, I thought about having my jaw wired up, but uh, it's a big problem, isn't it? Trying to force chicken McNuggets through the wire mesh. <laughs> so I knew, really, that I didn't actually have much choice apart from going to a health farm, and uh, that's a health spa in America, apparently. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the only people that go to them are kind of like that before they get there, aren't they, really? I found myself sharing a room with a fishing rod. <laughs> who later turned out to be quite a well-known model. Now, she was in there hoping to lose a quarter of an ounce off her eyelash, <laughs> whereas I was rather looking forward to getting out of the bath without the aid of an industrial winch. <laughs> 
Now, it's very boring there, so we both cheated, you know. She had an extra half a bran flake for breakfast, and I ate my bedroom. <laughs> Oh, that didn't work. So, you know, when I got back home, I thought, I'm going to forget about all this dieting rubbish. I read that book, Fat is a Feminist Issue, got halfway through and ate that as well. So, um... <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, you can always get reinforced underwear, can't you, if you're a bit on the fat side. Um, whalebone corsets are out, I'm afraid, <laughs> since Greenpeace came round and firebombed my knicker drawer. <laughs> And I will admit, actually, that from time to time, yes, I do go 10 rounds with an 18-hour girdle, but they don't work. Because they don't make the fat disappear, they just redistribute it. So that your stomach gets a bit smaller, but your neck ends up looking like Phyllis Holtz. <laughs> she's not anybody famous, she's just someone I know with a very fat neck. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you noticed this when I came on. A lot of people say this about me. You looked at me and you thought, that woman's a bit of a fashion goddess, didn't you? <laughs> I think so. Because I fall into that group of women who are euphemistically labelled by the fashion industry as revolting, obese lepers. And um, <laughs> we're kind of destined to wander around the streets, tearing our hair out and eating quite a lot of cakes, I might add until we come across an Evans outside shop. <laughs> so that's rather sad. But uh, I think you're a bit of a politically motivated audience, aren't you? So I'm going to talk about politics. I'm going to talk about our new Prime Minister, John Major. Because I think we have to say, John Major is the feminine hygiene equivalent of a panty liner, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? And I have to tell you, um, I'm rather worried about panty liners, really, because what I'd like to know is why women go out and buy them when they could be out buying beer and cigarettes like I do. It's a waste of money, isn't it? You can't get drunk on a panty liner, that's my motto. So don't buy them. And besides, you know, what was wrong with those navy blue baggy knickers we used to wear at school? Absolutely nothing because they had a double gusset which would protect you from the blast of an all-out nuclear strike. <laughs> and you could get your mum shopping in them on the way home, so they were great. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the worst thing's the name, isn't it? It's crap. Why can't they call them something nice? Like fairy hammocks, for example. <laughs> And let's be perfectly honest, you know, most of today's knickers are so small, you couldn't actually get a fairy hammock into them, could you? <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> I actually think that everyone's got two different types of knickers, really. The type you don't mind showing to people. <laughs> and the type you wish you'd buried six feet underground <laughs> with a wooden stake through them. <laughs> now, women have got two types of knickers. The first type are black, made of lace and the size of an atom. Whereas the second type, of course, are grey, the size of Buckinghamshire, <laughs> and you have to spray a hell of a lot of Charlie on them before you can wear them anywhere. <laughs> and you appear to know what I mean, which is a bit worrying. Um, but I'm not going to discriminate here, because I have to say, I don't think men's knickers are any better, are they, really? No. You get those sort of gold lame posing pouches, <laughs> which don't quite manage to cover the rolled-up sock, <laughs> yes, because we know you do it, boys. And uh, my favourites, actually, which are those charming nylon Y fronts with a very subtle slogan on the front, like, my penis is in here. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said before, you know, I'm not married, and I am getting extremely desperate, really. But um, if I was going to get married, there's one sort of guy I certainly wouldn't consider. The sort of guy that goes around pretending to be a bit of a feminist when he's not. You know the sort. Cosmo Man, I call him. <laughs> He's the man of the 90s. He's intelligent, sensitive, caring, well-read. What a boring old bastard he must be, <laughs> eh? But I shouldn't be rude about him because, of course, he is incredibly right on. His car isn't penis-shaped. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither is his penis, so... Um, <laughs> he's a complete waste of time, really. Now, um, I'm thinking of uh, going on my holidays fairly soon, and I'm not going to go abroad, do what everyone else does, you know. I'm going to stay at home and have a few nice little day trips out in my car to places <laughs> of local interest, like the cake shop. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And of course, you know, my car will never start, so I have to do what any normal, sensible young woman of today would do in my position. I have a cup of tea, I have 14 pieces of chocolate Swiss roll, and I call the AA. <laughs> That's AAA in America, okay? Good one there. And, uh, you know, I actually, I love them, because when that bloke gets there, you're so pleased to see him, you want to marry him, don't you? Well, I normally ask, because I think you've got to take every opportunity you can at my age, really. Now, um, it's time for me to wander off now, I think, and I'd actually just like to say, um, you've been very nice indeed. Uh, thank you for not heckling me, because I get heckled a lot, and I'm actually collecting some of my favourite heckles. Um, I had a lovely one recently. I went on at a club and said, good evening, you're a nice little crowd. And someone shouted out, yes, so are you. <laughs> so from one nice little crowd to another, thanks a lot. Good night. <laughs> Final act this evening, Pete McCarthy. Oh, um, sorry, you'll have to uh, excuse me. I've got a, a really terrible hangover. Uh, I always try uh, hair of the dog. It's the only cure that really works for me. Strange, isn't it? Last night when I wanted a drink, I shouldn't have had one. And today, when I can't face one, I've got to have one. Just another one of those little existential jokes that God likes to play on us every now and then. Oh, see, the thing about alcohol is it's a poison. Let's face it, alcohol tastes bad. That's why over the years we've evolved mixers to make it more palatable. Lager and lime, gin and tonic, whiskey and dry ginger, port and brandy. <laughs> but if we know that alcohol's a poison and we know that it tastes so bad, why do we spend so much time and energy acquiring a taste for the stuff in the first place? Some people say that it's down to our parents, that we associate the smell of alcohol with our father coming home after a few drinks <laughs> and starting to behave in a way we'd never seen him behave before. <laughs> Affectionately. But of course, of course, affection is only one of the many stages that alcohol takes us through. So what actually happens when you have a drink? All right, stage one, the first drink of the day. Alcohol enters the system and reaches the brain. You feel good. Not drunk, just convivial. Stage two, have another drink. Still convivial. You look around the room and think, ooh, what nice people. <laughs> Stage three, hey, this is all right. Think I'll have another drink. Aren't there a lot of sexually attractive people in this room? <laughs> Stage four, you know you've had enough. You shouldn't drink anything else. So you move on to the spirits. Stage five, the walls and floors have started to move. But why be hidebound by social convention? Hands and knees are a perfectly acceptable way of getting to the bathroom. <laughs> this is you at your best. You're still feeling good, still feeling convivial. Unfortunately, you won't remember a thing until you wake up ten hours later with a filthy hangover. Now, the first thing to do on waking with a hangover is check the room for any telltale signs of damage that might give you some clues as to what happened last night. What about the bed? Are you sharing it with any farmyard animals? <laughs> no? Good. There's just you and a pizza. Now, the, the reason you feel so bad the next day is partly because your internal filtration system has let you down and poisons have got through, and partly because you're dehydrated. Did you have the two pints of water to drink last night before going to bed like everyone says you should? No, of course you didn't. You didn't want to mix your drinks. It might have given you a hangover. <laughs> now, what can you do the night before to avoid having a morning after? Well, doctors say that you should limit your intake of alcohol to a safe level. Now, this is important. Doctors currently advise that the safe weekly intake of alcohol is 21 units. Sounds all right, doesn't it? 21 units per week. That is, until you find out what a unit of alcohol is. So, what is a unit of alcohol? A bath full of gin? No. A bucket full of Jack Daniels? No. It's a half a glass of beer. So, 21 units a week, that's three half glasses of beer a day. So that means, you know, provided you don't go mad and go out and have half a glass of beer at lunchtime, that means you can go out in the evening, have half a glass of beer at six o'clock, another half a glass of beer about ten past or quarter past nine, then one for the road at closing time. Well, what a great night out that was. <laughs> I mean, doctors, 
Really, I mean, how can anyone be expected to take ex-medical students seriously, especially on the subject of alcohol? I mean, I honestly cannot think of any social group less well-qualified to pontificate about the dangers of alcohol abuse than doctors. In my experience, all doctors are hopeless drunkards. I mean, why do doctors drink so much? Well, I suppose it gives them something to do while they're smoking. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about drinking when you're young, the thing about drinking when you're young is young people use alcohol in a very different way from older people. And especially young people have very different hangovers from older people. When you're young, you wake up feeling terrible, you can't remember a thing that happened last night, and you don't give a shit. Because when you're young, the whole point of alcohol is that it helps you to behave badly. It helps you to fight and smash things and dance and insult people and vomit and have sex with people you don't even like. Unlike your parents who also have to have sex with people they don't like, but they have to do it when they're sober. I mean, when you're young, a hangover is something to boast about. It gives you something to glory in, something to tell your friends about. Hey, oh, I feel really terrible today. I've got a terrible hangover. But as you get older, you realise that you can't do these crazy things anymore. Let's say as an experiment, let's say you stay at home alone for the evening and drink, I don't know, a litre of red wine, half a bottle of brandy, and then, perhaps unwisely, decide to wash it down with the last of that ouzo. All right. <laughs> then you pass out. Come on, everyone's done it. Then you pass out, all right? The next day, your head'll hurt. You'll have a hangover. But if you stay at home alone for the evening and drink the same litre of red wine, the same half bottle of brandy, and then unwisely decide to wash it down with the last of that ouzo, and then, instead of passing out, you have one of your great ideas, you decide to put on that old Leonard Cohen album that you haven't played for ten years. <laughs> then you start dancing to it on your own. And then carried along on the wave of sentimentality that comes from singing at the top of your voice at two o'clock in the morning and realising that you're not drunk. No, you're not drunk. You're a bit fired up, yeah, but you're not drunk. And in fact, you're in incredibly good shape, considering it's two o'clock in the morning and the people upstairs are banging on the ceiling, shouting, shut up! <laughs> then you decide to phone up that ex-girlfriend. <laughs> the one you haven't spoken to for five years, who's got two kids now and who's married to a policeman. And then when he answers the phone, sounding just a little bit annoyed, you say to him, look, listen, mate, just give her the message, will you? Tell her I still really love her. I've thought of her every day for five years. Look, I don't care about the kids. I'll look after the bloody kids. Just give her the message. And then, when he hangs up, you think, God, he sounds like a right bastard. I better phone him back and tell him. <laughs> and then when you do, his phone's engaged. You think, bloody hell. He's phoning people up at three o'clock in the morning. He must be pissed out of his head. He'll never remember to give her a message. I'd better write her a letter. So you sit down and you write a letter, then you rip it up. You think, no, 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 I'll write a poem. And so you write the poem, and then, realising that the people upstairs have stopped banging on the ceiling, you go up there, hammer on their door, wake them up, and ask them if they've got any drink they can lend you. And then, with your last coherent thought of the evening, you realise, this poem's embarrassing. <laughs> There's no way you're going to post this in the morning. So you go and post it now. <laughs> I'd just like to leave you now. Thank you, you've been very nice. I'd just like to leave you now with something that people say to each other before they go out and get very, very ill indeed. Your good health. Thanks a lot. <laughs> good night.